Alyssa, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, you are welcome to push the record button. Everyone, my name is Molly Giannis. Thank you for joining us today for our introduction to project management, uh, to change management. I apologize. Um, so really quick, uh, Echo Consulting, we are uh, oh, actually a project management consulting firm. So we focus on, uh, I've got some background noise. Melissa, can you mute whoever I have background noise from? Um, so we offer project management, short-term, part-time, strategic and annual planning, program portfolio, uh, software implementations, process improvement, training and mentorship, and much more. Um, so for today, we do like to do very interactive uh, webinars. So you are welcome to join video you are welcome to interrupt and ask questions. If you would prefer, you are able to go ahead and use the chat. Um, Melissa will be monitoring chat and will interrupt me um, as we go. If there are questions, feedback, uh, I will ask for audience participation in some cases. Pamela, I think you've got some background noise, so if you can go ahead and mute, that would be great. Um, I do that. ask, yep, no problem. I do ask that, yeah, if you can stay muted unless when you want to interrupt to ask a specific question or answer a question, that would be great. Um, we will be recording this session and we will be sending out a copy of these slides. So you're welcome to take notes or screenshots to your heart content, but we will definitely send that out after this meeting as well, so you don't need to. All right, with that, oh, and one other thing, we will send out a survey. We love doing these uh, webinars. We love feedback on them. So if you get a moment, say what was useful, what wasn't useful, what you'd like to see more of, we would really appreciate that. So with that, uh, I'm going to dive right in because we have a lot of really exciting content today and I want to make sure that we leave time for questions and input from the audience on what to talk more about. So we're going to start with a really quick, this is an intro to change management course, but as if you've done um, a webinar with me before, you know we'll talk a lot about examples. Um, so we want to start by grounding us with what change management is. There's a lot of different definitions. Um, I'm going to give you a basic one. So it's the disciplined approach or structured process instead of tools. Um, leading the people side of change. So you're trying to achieve a desired um, outcome and you are focused on the people side of change. So as I mentioned early on, right, we are a project management firm. So what I wanted to start talking about is change management versus project management. There is um, definitely some um, you know, question about, well, wait a second, shouldn't change management just be managed by a project manager? Um, it's a great question, especially as you're looking to put the business case together to really expand the maturity of your change management practice in an organization. Um, what I like to think about it is people's title versus people's roles. So you can wear multiple hats. You can be a project manager and a change manager um, if, if your company allows for that and your time and capacity allows for that. Um, the skill sets do have overlapping components, um, but there really is a need for distinct roles and responsibilities in change management versus in project management. So again, change management at a high level, managing the people side of change. Project management, if we look at the PMBOK definition, it's a framework, knowledge, schools, uh, skills, and tools, similar to change management, and techniques to help meet the project goal, right? So definitely some overlap there. Um, one of the things I like to talk a little bit about is kind of that change management and some of the frameworks that we think about from a business transformation side of things. So the original framework, it came out in the 1950s and 60s, um, Levitt's diamond model. Um, and so that has the structures and tasks. So if we think about those kind of as work and then people and technology, and it had change in the middle. So this was actually the original. One that you might be more familiar with looking at is more from this people process technology. That's kind of more form, um, that's more well known and that's really got established in the 1960s. What's interesting is what people have done with this breakdown of people process and technology. And so they've started to look at, okay, if we think about different types of projects and business transformation initiatives, what they are focused on. So if you're looking at something where you're primarily focused on the people and process side of things, you're probably trying to scale your organization or your impact. If you're thinking of people and technology, they often talks about innovation. Um, and if you're talking about technology and process, oftentimes you're talking about automation, right? Not saying that there's no people component of technology process automation, right? Not saying that there's no process and business process improvement changes with innovative proje uh, projects. Um, and certainly with scaling, having tools to back that up is really useful. Um, but that's kind of the focus area that we're looking at. 
what's really interesting is how people have taken this, right? So they've actually looked at, okay, so what is the center? What is the cross section of people, process, and technology? Different people think different things. Some people say this is where change happens, transformation. Sometimes they say when you combine people, process, and technology, that's really where success is. That's where the magic happens. They say that's where your culture is or strategy. A lot of different organizations view this differently. I think we can all agree that the, the, the major component Component is that we are trying, we are focused on change, whatever that looks like. Hopefully continuous improvement and change for the better, although we certainly have changes for the worse. So um, when we think about this and we talk about people, process, and technology and different frameworks for identifying change, one of the things I like to think about is what different types of change there are. And again, there are lots of different schools of thought anywhere from there are two different types of change to 12 different formal types of change. Um, so I like to think of everything in, in terms of a, con of, a, of a continuum, right? So you have something that's called small adaptive. So you're adapting an existing process and existing technology. You're adding a skill to an existing resource, right? Kind of a smaller, more uh, distinct change versus transformational change, right? So completely changing the paradigm of an organization or of a group of individuals. Um, but there's many different ways to think about the change that you're looking to um, ad adopt. So one way to consider it is proactive versus reactive change, right? So when we think about things like COVID is a great example that I use a lot, right? During COVID, that was a lot of reactive change, right? That wasn't something that was planned for. That wasn't something that we had time associated with to make that transition. That was we immediately needed to make a change versus proactive, which would be planned change in most cases, um, even preparing for change that is coming because we know something is happening. The same concept, planned versus unplanned change. So proactive, we're doing it ahead of time. Reactive, it's happened, and now we need to react to our environment planned versus unplanned. There's incremental versus radical change. You may have heard of this, you know, more kind of like agile versus big bang. Waterfall is another way to think about that, but these are changes that happen over time. They're potentially phased in and out versus a radical change, which is like we are completely cutting over from one system to another. We're completely changing offices or, or whatever that change is. Um, it's a more radical and it typically has a more um, concrete deadline. They're oftentimes called big bang changes. Right, we have tactical versus strategic change. And again, that talks a little bit to sizing, um, but if we think about it more um, tangible changes, like we're, we're switching from, the, from A to B versus strategic, which is we are currently in environment A and we have this idea of environment B and we think we know how to get there, but we don't. Um, so when we think about strat strategic change, it's maybe a little bit less tangible. Um, realignment versus restructure is another way to think about this, like we're realigning to goals that already exist or um, uh, or we're restructuring completely and we have a whole new set of goals, a whole new set of objectives, a whole new mission for our organization potentially. Um, and then we can think about the scope of change. So change that really impacts a single individual. So whether that is adding a new role in your organization, whether that's replacing a role that currently exists with a series of other roles versus a group where you're potentially impacting a single department or function within your organization versus organization wide change. OK, so that's more talking about the scope of impact, um, but those are all different types of change. Does anyone have one any questions associated with types of change or other types of change that they um, the way that they describe change in their organization that they want to share? I can keep going, but here we go. All right, so types of change. So one of the reasons you may be here <laughs> is because change management projects often fail and they're really hard and they're really emotional and for a lot of people and really this distinct concept of project management versus change management or operational management versus change management is still establishing itself as a discipline. We're going to talk about some of the most popular change management frameworks, but um, oftentimes people are coming in that they don't have a change management discipline in their organization. Maybe they do have a project management discipline or a PM or project manager, but having that as like a separate set of skills for change manager 
oftentimes is not the case. So um, it can be really difficult. We want to talk about some of the reasons that change management projects fail and some strategies that you can take away from this to really think about how you can help that. So there are so many different reasons that changes fail in an organization or in a team or even in a family unit. Um, we provided just some of the really well known and most obvious ones, but we'll talk about some, some more specific examples today. So one of the big ones is that you have a lack of buy into the change. So people really aren't interested in adopting. You don't really have an internal champion in the organization, whatever that looks like. Lack of strategic uh, alignment across the organization. So when there's a change, but not everyone in the organization agrees with it, maybe you don't have leadership buy into the change and you're not really getting that back up. Cultural misalignment. So trying to um, implement change on an organization that culture just it doesn't really fit and they're not keeping in mind the people, what their history is and what their kind of emotional component associated with that. Lack of communication. I know you've never seen that in any of my webinars before, talking about lack of communication as a reason for failure. And then not providing training and support. Now, what's interesting is that not providing training and support is probably what most people blame change failure on. And it, as a project manager, it's definitely like the most obvious and most tangible. It's what comes up the most in lesson learned activities and retrospective is like, oh, we didn't get enough training. We didn't have enough hyper care support. It's the most obvious thing that people tend to point towards in my experience. Um, but really change management happens much, should be happening much further um, earlier on in the process than when you actually get to training and support. And you really can have a pretty good understanding of whether or not a change is going to take long before training really happens. Um, so we'll talk about some of that structure today and how we can um, help alleviate some of these change failures. Um, again, there are hundreds of reasons that changes fail. Does anyone want to have any other really popular reasons that change fail in their organization they want to share with the group? All righty, we'll keep going, but you can jump in and feel free to comment um, or drop a comment in the resistance, message. Resistance to change. Resistance to change. Michael, thank you so much. We are going to be talking about that. So I highlighted that in terms of lack of buy-in, but specifically resisting change is definitely one of those areas to overcome, and we want to talk about some strategies and ideas for that. And Michael, since you have experience with that, I'm looking forward to your ideas as well. All right, so. I Sorry, I have oh, something yes, to add to. Yes. Sorry, um, June here. The um, I feel like another reason is not enough time to do all of the things that you are listing here. <laughs> yes, reduced resources as well. Yes. Um, so do you have the right stakeholders in there? Do you have the right people? Do you have the right time? Was it built into the process from the beginning? So we can talk a little bit about best practices, right? But we also need to talk about reality. And in reality for a lot of organizations, especially small to mid-size, is that they don't have a change management practice in their organization. So what can we do as individual contributors and roles to help um, to help alleviate some of these risks to projects? success. Applying change management best practices for better results. So let's get into it. So um, Prusky is, is the most well known, just like PMI for project management. This is probably the most well known model. We're going to use this model for some of our content today, but we're going to use some other tools and tips that come from other places as well. So at a high level, they break it down um, into five different phases. So awareness, of the need for change, like what is the business case that this change needs to happen? Um, desire, so who are who's going to champion in this? So who's going to participate and support the change? Um, either going to champion it or going to be dragged along because they need to provide some sort of consulting to make sure that um, this happens. Um, and then the knowledge of how to change, so the skills to actually make a change from the current state to the future state. Um, and then the ability to implement the desired skills and behaviors. So we're going to talk a little bit about the training and support aspect of this to actually be able to make that change. And then the reinforcement. So, OK, now the change has happened. The cutover has happened. But how do we make sure that it sticks? How do we make sure that it's adopted and that you can continue to build on the change from there and that it doesn't just stop um, and then you can't continue on a more positive trajectory? 
ADCAR model, it's probably the most well known. So uh, it, they're not individual boxes where awareness happens and then it just stops and then desire happens and then it just stops. We're going to show it's actually like it's overlaps. Awareness is important. And if you think about it, as we talk about stakeholder groups, right? When people become aware of this need for change might be different depending on what stakeholder groups. So are they either the strategic senior leadership that are driving the change? Hopefully, are they the indirect? Are they the direct stakeholders that are going to be directly impacted? Like my job is going to be impacted by this or are they indirect stakeholders further down the line that will be you know that need to be aware of it because someone else further up the line is getting um, impacted so these are not beautiful little boxes like this they all integrate with each other but we want to start at the right place which is awareness for the need of change okay so when we again project management hat i can't help myself right but when we think about the awareness for uh, change there does need to be a plan associated with that um now how you come up with that plan is different depending on the different types of changes but some core pieces that you need to identify how formal again depends on the culture of your organization the size of the change um, the type of change and things like that but at minimum we need to know why are you changing what's the pain point or what What's the opportunity um, that is driving this change to happen? And also, who is a driver of the change, right? Is it coming from top down? Is it coming from bottom up? Is it coming from external customers or environment? Like, what are the drivers for the change? Um, identifying the stakeholders in the change, and these are people that are going to be impacted by the end result, as well as people that are going to be impacted um, during the process of the change. What does a successful change look like? Um, who is it going to impact? What's it going to impact? What do we think the return on investment for this change is going to be? And then looking at what the execution looks like. So the plan itself. And we'll talk really quickly about a change management plan version, but definitely Googleable. They have a lot of different examples for this. So identifying the stakeholders, I've mentioned this a couple times. So um, people that can have impact on the change. So these are key decision makers within the organization. This might be a senior leader. Um, this could also be potentially a, a, a customer, depending on your organization um, and or potentially uh, like if you are bringing in a new person to a team, like a new manager or something like that, uh, it could be their team. So primary stakeholders, direct stakeholders, these are people that are going to have an impact, their job, their role, their responsibilities. Um, their outputs are going to be directly impacted by the change versus secondary stakeholders or indirect stakeholders. Um, they are more from uh, further down the line for output. Um, so there's many other ways to distinguish between stakeholder groups, definitely. Um, but I want you to at least think about, okay, these are all the people that we think are going to be impacted. These can provide that you know, impetus for the change. These people are going to actually be directly imp um, impacted. Um, and then we want to start thinking about stakeholder buy-in. So once we have a list of the stakeholders, um, we want to understand their pain points, their challenges. Um, also, if we think about it, depending on the change, and if you have this level of maturity, we want to start thinking about the stakeholder themselves. And um, again, Michael mentioned it and said it really well, which is that resistance, right? If you have experience with those stakeholders, um, you have people that love change and you have people that hate change and everywhere in between. So identifying those stakeholders and how comfortable they are with change um, is really helpful early on. Um, so introduce, uh, introducing change starting at the top. So it's really important for the success of the change to have confidence from the leadership team um, that this change is important. And so the first thing you need to do is get leadership buy-in. So if you are the person that is driving the change and requesting the change and making the change, in this case, you do need to start from the top. And that is regardless of the of the culture of the organization, which is a little bit uncomfortable for people because oftentimes they're thinking, you know, change from the bottom up. Um, you do need to have that confidence with a chain of the leadership team if you're going to be rolling out change across multiple functions. OK, so again, this is a little bit area of like is a little bit political and different cultures of organizations feel a little bit differently here. Um, you can disagree with me, um, but it's really critical that you do have that executive sponsor stakeholder team um, that is going to be buy in um, in order to really get that change across. Alrighty. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, so 
I want to talk a little bit about types of communications that we might have in an organization, um, and especially in change management. So one of the different types is um, the type where you're starting to involve people. And so these typically are more social conversations, open conversations. We used to call them water cooler conversations. Um, it's really more um, informal communication in general, um, and just kind of understanding where they where they fit in in the continuum of the of, of change comfort level. Um, and you're really just trying to see who's involved, who wants to get involved, um, and what their capacity for change is at the moment. Um, maybe they have five other changes going on in this department, so you're just kind of socializing that concept to see if they're willing to be involved. Then there's more consultative types of communication. So these are typically where you're looking to baseline um, in an organization. So you're looking for surveys, you're requesting input, maybe you have a, um, you know, an opportunity for people to put their ideas in. Oftentimes this can be a Q&A question, there could be focus groups, like you're consulting a wider audience um, about the different change. Then there's different types of communications that are more about partnering. Um, so where you might have a steering committee, you might have identified champions or subject matter experts that want to be involved, that we need involved in the change in order to make it possible. And then there's informational types of communication. So these are announcements. These are really critical communication points, which is this is when this is happening. This is why this is happening. Um, this is it's content that might come out via an email or a website. It might come out on an all hands meeting. Um, they're oftentimes date oriented um, and more structured structured types of communications. They can be a meeting, but they definitely need documentation associated with them. Any questions about types of communication? So if we think about a communication plan, again, extremely high level, just a really quick example. So discussing the business case for a change, what are the drivers and impacts? That's an involved type. Usually it actually happens like in an existing meeting. Maybe the need for the change comes up because it's a pain point in an existing meeting. Um, ideally, it would be a, you know the audience of someone that's a decision maker um, about the change, if possible. Even if like the conversation happened at a water cooler, like having it come up in a decision making meeting would be ideal. Um, challenges, opportunities, invitation for feedback and ideas. These are more consultative types of communication, survey and questionnaire. Um, you really want to focus on the direct stakeholders in this case. Um, not that indirect stakeholders can't have impact as well in senior leaders, but ideally you're really looking for those people that it's their day to day job responsibilities that are changing. Um, developing a training and communication plan, that's usually a team of people that are associated with the change. If it's also like directly related to an identified project, it can be the project steering committee or a separate like offshoot of champions. And these are typically start as meetings, but also have documented deliverables as part of them. And then announcements, there should be a very clear communication plan associated with any cutovers that need to happen, any trainings that need to happen, um, any updates. If you're doing like an update to Office 365 or something like that, technology update, these are really clear informational. And it's really important. So one of the issues that we get brought in on sometimes is that the communication, depending on your organization and the maturity, you may or may not have a communications department or a person responsible for internal communications, and that's fine. Um, if it is an IT change, you want to make sure sure that someone is reviewing the communication from a more communication or end user perspective. So these informational types of communications can be really off putting if the right um, the right cultural view of this and the right like individual view isn't put on this. So we want to make sure that informational is still is informative and date oriented and like has very structured document information, but that the tone of it um, the summary of it, like making it accessible to the stakeholders. And again, being careful with informational um, emails and making sure that the direct stakeholders and indirect, or stake, indirect stakeholders might be separated based on the amount of information they need at the time of that. So that can be something that can provide a lot of help and benefit um, to making sure that you're not grouping those two groups together and overloading the indirect stakeholders that don't need that much information.
All right, so I did want to just, this is one of my <laughs> favorite slides. Um, so when we think about communication methods in general and change management, project management, et cetera, we have to be aware that we have a continuum of different participants that are more vocal and more quiet, right? And when we think about meetings, especially group meetings, people that are more vocal end up getting their perspective heard more than someone that's quiet. We kind of know that, right? Even in emails, well, some people are more um, willing to communicate in writing or instant, mess instant messaging. Um, we still have to be aware that there are different types of people and their comfort level in, com in direct communications, right? So if we look at just, you know, meetings, feedback on documents, weekly meetings, instant messaging, like we, we end up with the loudest, right? end up with more um, input and perspective on what the change is happening or what project is happening. So one of the things you want to keep in mind is varying your different communication methods to understand and try to get more input from the people that are quieter or maybe a little bit less direct in their communication methods. And so one of the way to do that is via surveys and questionnaires and anonymous voting and really keeping it anonymous. Um, one of the way to do that is to do one on ones, maybe not weekly in this case, but like maybe do one on ones with specific stakeholders that you haven't heard a lot about. Um, sometimes the quiet people can really be like the turning point for a change um, because they either have experience or they haven't been heard previously and they can really provide that. So again, keep in mind your different communication methods. Um, so I want to touch back on project management versus change management. And again, recognizing that we have all different size companies and all different size organizations with different maturity. I'm not saying that a project manager and a change manager always have to be two different people. Um, but the skill sets and the, and the deliverables associated with project management and change management do both need to be articulated and understood. Um, so when we think about this, we have this technology process and people, project management impacts oftentimes technology process and people, change management as well, like there are tools and processes associated with change management, but it tends to focus more on the people and process side of things, right? We're taking something from the current state, whatever that is, we're going through this awkward transition time, and then we are moving to a future state. Whether it's a big bang or whether it's transitional, right? Like that can kind of depend on how long each of these different phases are, but we need to have a clear understanding of what the current state is, what we have to manage while it's in this awkward transition where it's neither the current nor the future state, as well as be able to support the future state, whatever that looks like. So change management is not just coming in to train on what the future state is. Change management should be knowing what the current state is, understanding and being able to help additional communication and um, tools and tips and things like that in the transition phase and changing throughout the transition phase because different people get information at different times as well as supporting the training of the future state. Okay, so project management, change management, complementary, overlapping for sure, um, but understand that um, change management occurs throughout the entire, not just in the future state, um, and change management does require that you have a good understanding of what the current state is. Important to have a change management plan, so understanding what the business case vision for the change is, analyzing the impact of the change, understanding what the change future hold, communication over the course of the entire change, implementing the change, training, and then evaluating the implementation. So not too similar, not too dissimilar from project management. Um, rolling it up, right, so that you have those milestones of what those changes happen. So thinking about current state, when are we actually starting to make those transition changes? What are those milestones throughout the transition as well as the actual cutover? Um, so making sure that it can be rolled up and shared out with a wider audience, especially senior executives, about what those uh, key milestones are. Importance of socializing the change, so voicing the drivers for the change, map out what success looks like, transparent impact, sharing the execution plan and approach. I think that we were talking a little about this earlier, discussing, not dictating, so offering transparency, being clear about what you know and what you don't know, right? Um, inviting input early on in the process, active listening, empathy for the change um, for people that are undergoing the change and validating the different perspectives um, are all incredibly helpful 
soft skills as well um, when we're thinking about a change. So um, one of the interesting newsletters I'm um, signed up for on LinkedIn actually um, is from a proxy um, like director of technology there or something. And one of the um, things is talking about flipping the phrases. So one of the phrases that's actually a huge turnoff for a lot of people based on studies is like, we're all in the same team. So as a leader, when we're saying like, hey, we're all on the same team, that can actually come across as really inauthentic because like, yeah, we're all on the same team, but this is actually directly impacting my day to day and my ability to do my job, whereas it's not directly impacting your ability to do your job. So trying to remain authentic um, and providing space for people to um, provide their perspective and tell you their truth. Active listening, being attentive, asking open ended questions versus yes, no, requesting clarifications, paraphrasing. These are all strategies on how to work with people to understand um, their position on change um, and reflecting their feelings. As we know, change can be a very emotional thing for many people. Um, so when we think about that, understanding the human reaction, I think Brian was the one that said that this is very similar to like the stages of grief, maybe, um, but really like when a change comes for people that aren't the ones that are actually driving the change, it can be really shocking and there can be some denial, frustration and resistance before we can move on to exploration, acceptance and then evolution. Um, so what are some of the tips and tools that we have for dealing with denial as well as frustration and resistance? So for denial, typically avoidance, withdrawal, disbelief, maybe they're going silent. This is never going to happen. It's never happened before. This isn't impacting me like this is not. So frequent communication um, as close to their team as possible, um, providing more details and timeline and what to expect and addressing rumors and misinformation um, very directly. So one of the clients we worked with um, actually invited before their all hands meetings for people to to ask questions anonymously and then they shared all of the questions anonymously that were asked and some of them were like borderline not rude but like really like there's no way this is happening right but like addressing them directly versus just ignoring people that are in denial like addressing directly is really important um resistance and frustration so there's a lot of complaining hostility skepticism lack of concentration it's not there um, i'm leaving it this doesn't make any sense um, so we want to make sure that we are providing opportunities um, to influence participation. So we want to understand um, like how when I go into a project, oftentimes my best champions are people that initially were like the loudest detractors from the process. Like if you can get to those people and like really dig in on like why they're resisting, maybe they have a previous experience with this that they need to share. Um, but involving those people, um, oftentimes it can be a skill gap, especially if we're looking at maybe you're in a situation where there's a lot of tribal knowledge, someone that has like a lot of manual processes where they are the only one that know can do that. We can experience a lot of resistance in those cases when we go to like roll out a new technology or try to bring information more visible. Um, so definitely giving some time for preparing and training and like inviting them to train others and be part of the solution. Um, and then honestly setting really clear expectations and deadlines. And, um, and this is an area, unfortunately, that can need escalation and where it's really critical that you have senior leadership support here. Does anyone want to weigh in on this one? We'll talk a little bit more about this later as well. Okay. Exploration. Um, so exploring different options, starting to be willing to risk take. Oftentimes we try to line this up with like a pilot in a project or something like that. So you can allow people like a place that's very safe to fail. Um, like they get to try out their new school, like new tools. They get to try out their new process. Um, they can try to pick it apart and break it. Um, you're trying to focus on like really short term goals and priorities, um, really like focusing on new skills, like having people demo things or like ask really great questions um, and providing a lot of positive feedback and acknowledging efforts and contributions and things like that. This is a really good opportunity for leaders um, if they've identified someone in their team that maybe wants to maybe is asking for a promotion or is asking for how they can grow in their career. Like when you're going through a change or having a project, it's a huge opportunity 
as a leader to like give specific individuals an opportunity to say like, hey, I really need help with managing this change. Like, can you, you know what I mean? Can you help me with this testing? Can you help me with this team and like bringing it through? So this can be a really good opportunity or a tool for a leader um, to get people um, more involved and more engaged. And then we've heard a lot about um, the great resignation, right? So it's like, how do you keep people engaged? Some people can be really engaged when they're learning new things um, and they're getting the opportunity to step out of their, you know, day to day. So this could be a great tool. Um, so acceptance. So starting to think about like future state and like actually recognizing like applying to, to how this would work with your job today, um, you know, initiating conversations about things. Um, Oftentimes people start asking questions like, oh, can it do this? Or, oh, can we do this too? And it's almost sometimes as a project manager and change manager, you actually need to like parking lot it saying like, yes, that's exactly what we were thinking about for phase two. Like, yes, this is what, like, we want to make sure that we're validating that, yes, they got the right idea. We're really excited about that. But also recognizing that like you want to, you want to kind of bucket the change in a certain way and move it through with the opportunity to do additional change as we go as well. Um, so we want to provide, continue to provide support, guidance, training, frequent feedback on progress. Um, we want to give people the opportunity to opt in to being a champion, to opt in to if there's a certification process or something like that. Like we really want to give people an opportunity to kind of shut their stuff and get their gold stars in this case. Um, and then the evolution. So this is really self-sufficiency. Um, how can you prove that you can build additional change on top of this and you can continue to move? So fully embracing and we're really forming new habits at this point. So reinforcement, continued training, um, motivation for new habits. So when we think about desire, um, so one of the techniques is skill will hill assessment. So skill, assessing the current skill level, what knowledge skills must be developed to thrive in the desired future state. So basically a gap analysis, um, who has the will to change um, and what are their attitudes and behavior in their organization. And then the hill, what obstacles and barriers will be faced to successfully implement the change. So that's one method we've worked with some clients on. It's like, okay, what are the gaps? What, you know, gap analysis, it can be skills. It can be other types of gaps as well, tools, um, uh, uh, tools like whether they are um, like a, a software tool or honestly like a physical machine based tool um, or licensing or something like that who has the will and the motivation to do it versus not. So oftentimes we'll talk a little bit about um, the like early adopters versus early majority, late majority, and kind of late adopters. That's pretty typical in an organization. So knowing who the people are that'll be your early adopters. Um, and then also who those key people are that can really drive other people to jump on the bandwagon. So identifying them to spend your time kind of most efficiently on those people that really do bring the rest of their team with them. Um, and then understanding that there's always going to be obstacles and barriers to change, spending time to really think about what those obstacles and barriers are, to list them out, and to think proactively about mitigation strategies for that um, can be really, really helpful. Um, another tool that we've used is the force field analysis. So if we look at the proposed change, what is driving the change? What are the forces for change? So maybe this is from like top down. Maybe this is from uh, because of personnel change. Maybe this is because of a tool that has a big cutover coming. What are the forces against change? It's busy season. We're really busy. We don't have enough resources. Um, the forces against change, like there's someone that has all the information and they're out on vacation and they're like don't want to give us the right information. We don't have the resources to really enact the change correctly. So thinking about what the forces for change and the forces against change um, is really helpful as well. So a resistant management plan. So what are your steps, strategies, activities, and approach to identify, evaluate, manage resistance? So again, um, this can be, again, culturally, you got to figure out the right place for this, but identifying individual stakeholders and their willingness to change um, and, and how to manage that is something that we've definitely done with organizations. So we did an Office 365 implementation. Um, we had a championship team. It was awesome. Um, but, you know, there were definitely some people that were super excited about the change and some people that were initially resistant and like identifying them directly and thinking about some of the mitigating strategies was something that we um, we worked through. Um, 
identifying the change champions. So who are the people that like get the vision are super excited, bring the energy. It's so important to have change champions from within the team to really drive that forward. So um, if you want a successful change, identifying who those change champions are and bring them on um, pretty early. Change coalition, steering committee, whatever you want to call this governance board. So who are the team leaders that need to be evolved? Who are going to be those role models for change? Um, again, the gaps in the knowledge communication training plan. Um, so what do we, how do we know when employees have reached a desired um, state? So too often we're providing training. We're just doing it via meeting. What if someone misses it? Do they actually do the recording? Is there any test to see that they've actually completed what they need? Um, different people learn in different ways. We all know this, so one size doesn't fit all in training. So webinars, pre-recorded videos for one person, handouts documented step-by-step -step for another, office hours where you can ask questions for another person, process flow charts, right? So um, cold learning style, so reflective observation. So someone that needs to hear something and then they need to spend time just in their own head. Um, thinking about that, active experimentation. I need my hands on the keyboard. Conceptualization versus like concrete learning. So different people start at different places and really how they dig in. So active experimenting, jumping in, playing with the program. Maybe there's the people that just like to Google things. Um, thinking about what you just experienced, what worked well, what didn't work, how you would need to tweak it to make it work for you reading a manual to get an understanding, like to get a framework in your head about what needs to happen before you actually get in there, because otherwise it's overwhelming and you don't feel like you learn anything. Or actually using a help feature, a learning center of someone like specifically uh, training you on that specific step. So when we think about our training plan, think about different people learn in different ways. Um, one of the first questions I often ask both of my team as well as my clients is like, how do you learn best? And then also, how do you like learning? So it sounds funny, but some people learn best one way, but the way they actually like to learn is different. Um, so again, thinking about one, what gives people energy in terms of to like really dig in, but also how they actually learn and retain information the best. And those might not always line up. Hopefully they do, but they don't. So we need to give a wide, um, a wide variety of options here for training. Um, ability, so Practice runs <laughs> is really important. So that's where we um, really push on um, both the uh, pilot. So actually doing it with real information, doing it in a real process um, so that we can dig in. Um, definitely practice cutovers and understanding what that looks like. Um, so practice, practice, practice. One of the things about practice, and I think I have an article on this somewhere, but what we're really talking about with practice is not practice as in we do it perfect, but practice is a safe place so that we can fail and that we're okay with failing and that we know that we're just learning, right? Like we want practice to be a place where it's like, it's okay, it's expected to fail, like you don't know how to do this yet versus game time where it's like, here we go, like you're supposed to know this and if you make a mistake, it's a big deal. Um, people are way less willing to take risks during like a game or uh, more risks like when it's actually live or they think that they can break something. So honestly, as a change leader, it's really important to find that safe space for people where they can feel like they can explore. Um, change readiness assessment. Um, we have a version of this, but again, like this is one of those things you want to Google. Um, there's different types of change readiness assessments. There's a lot of versions out there, um, but like really clear questions about how ready your company is for change. So I've definitely used this as a project manager for different types of projects. Um, and ideally you do this long before you get to like a go, no go meeting or something, but it's like, are you clear on what the problem you're solving with this change is? Um, do you have a clear vision for the change? Do you understand what policies, processes must change? Like, do you understand the interoperability of the change and like all the different things it's going to impact? Have you checked with all of those different stakeholder groups? Are they bought in? Um, do you know who's owning the change, who's sponsoring the change, who's driving the change? And do you know how you'll measure? There are literally hundreds of questions for change readiness that can get very granular. Um, but I highly recommend if you have no concept of change readiness or change management organization, that's okay. 
Um, you can start from a Googled version of a change readiness assessment, start walking through those questions um, with that team. And when you have a big gap, that's a place to start and address. Okay. Earlier the better, as always. Expectations. So I usually start, this doesn't have to be super heavy. I usually start with a smart goal, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely, but set, set clear and reasonable goals and metrics. So one of the big things would change, and I think June said it really well, which is just like, there's no way that there's enough time to be able to go do this. And if you go ahead and you start announcing things that no one believes are possible and no one's bought into, you're undermining your authority and your authenticity and everything else. And you're really undermining the ability for the change to be successful if you're not setting reasonable expectations. And if you're setting expectations without like asking for any input on them, if it's all one-sided. Um, monitoring performance, di diagnosing gaps, managing resistance, implementing corrective actions, celebrating successes, definitely important. Like, hey, we hit this, guys. Like, let's keep going, trying to get momentum. Um, feedback, making sure you collect feedback. What are those feedback mechanisms, whether it's a form, whether it's a one on one, what that is, actually tracking that, baselining where you are now and where you're going so you can show progress. Um, reinforcements. Um, so, habit change. Right, like really want to get to habit. So obvious, attractive, easy, satisfying. Um, how do we how do we make this change work? Um, and then recognition, continued support, etc. So I made it through. I talked fast again. I can't help myself, guys. I'm so sorry. Um, but uh, I'm just going to leave this here. Awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, reinforcement. And I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions, scenarios where you've run into, um, where we can kind of dig in a little bit deeper. Um, and again, we're going to send this deck out. This was an intro to change management. If we get enough interest, we can definitely do um, a more hands-on approach change management because this is an area that I'm in love with right now. So anyone want to share a... A challenge they're having with change management in their organization or a question they had um, that they'd like to go any deeper in on what we talked about today. And if you don't want to unmute, you can definitely just chat it. Um, you can chat directly to Melissa or I if you feel more comfortable and you don't want people to know who asked the question. Wow, quiet group today, guys. I mean, I can jump in to sort of address my my amount of time question because for, yes. for me, and I don't know if this is true for anyone else on the call, but I love coming to these webinars. I love learning tools and processes for accomplishing the tactical things that I need to do at work. But one of the thing, traps that I fall into, um, because maybe because I'm a little bit more process oriented, is that I take all of this stuff and I, I take it like uh, one for one, right? And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do this step, then I'm gonna do this step, then I'm gonna do this step. And it ends up taking me a really long time to do something. And maybe that's okay the first time around because um, I'm still learning how to do it. But I'm now I'm realizing one of the things that I wanna take away from any of these learning webinars that I go to is how can I either fit it into my daily work or shorten what I have seen on screen. Um, and I was just pulling up an example. We recently went through some uh, change management and how we talk about the type of work we do, um, how we intake projects and how we um, sort of evaluate them and place them. So it was a lot of around like changing definitions of the types of work we do and then showing people how we're changing this process. And from the sort of directive of our leadership of like, we want you guys to change this to actually presenting it this morning with our um, department um, took probably three months. And, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like we did some of these steps naturally um, and some of them uh, maybe we could have done a better job on, but mm -hmm. I, it just, I guess stating that it, it took us that long to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and and that for me, like sometimes I want it to be much quicker than that. And our leadership too, they, they're they like, we decided we want this change. And so yeah. then they want it to happen tomorrow. 
not just you and not just your leadership team, right? In general, when we've made the decision to go forward with the change, we want it to be immediate, right? We're not as humans particularly patient on this. And we often miss, right, dependencies on these different things, which can make it take a lot longer. And it makes us be much more reactive in our approach rather than proactive in our approach. So you're not alone, June, at all. Um, and I would say that to an organization, so you guys are, are talking about the types of work and things like that. Um, that's something that can be really hard because you're taking it from one habit and like one cultural like norm and trying to reestablish a new cultural norm in terms of not just your vocabulary, but the way that like you connect with it as well. Um, and so three months doesn't sound like long at all to me. Are you saying three months to like just present what the recommendation is and you still have to do the implementation of it? Or are you saying that like now the new the new standard, the new future state is supposed to be in place. I guess a little bit of both three months to um, for every all the sort of key stakeholders and owners of the change to mm -hmm. align on the language and process uh, to get to the place where we could uh, share it with the entire department. And in the meantime, we have also been making adjustments um, Based Constant on, incremental, yeah. right? Yeah. Incremental testing that a little bit and then going. Yeah, no. Um, so one of the things for product management and change management, right, is like having the right the right amount of what I call overhead or like weight to it, right? So like I've been in a lot of organizations where there's like no transparency of status or anything like that. So they go really heavy on the process and really heavy on all these different things. And they kind of like, it's a pendulum. You go back and forth and kind of figure out what you actually need for your organization. Um, so I would say that um, right sizing it were. I think that the process does a really good job, right? So awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, reinforcement, what specific deliverables you need within each of those really depends on the type of change, the size of your organization, and the number of stakeholders you have. So the more stakeholders and the more complex the change is, the longer it's going to take um, and the more formal you need to be in your process in order to drive success. Similarly, the more background, um, the more involved like the senior leadership team is and the clearer the directive that you've been given to implement the change, again, the faster that that change can happen. Um, when it's very much just like, hey, we want to make this change and then tell us when it's done, um, that tends to take a lot longer um, because consensus building with large groups of people can be really difficult. Um, so I would say that one of the strategies, if you're trying to bring the timeline in, is to bring the driver of the change, the senior leader in more frequently, um, if you're looking to cut back on the timeline a little bit. Um, and for more people, um, documenting, because meetings with large groups of people and alignment and consensus building a large group of people um, takes longer. So having more concrete deliverables and documents between can be more useful. Whereas when you have a small group, um, you know, less document documentation can take additional time, additional heaviness and things like that, that people kind of lose focus on. Um, it, it, again, I, I'm sorry, I can't give you a direct answer on that, but it sounds like um, if you really just got the directive from your senior leadership team and then kind of presented it, um, you might have wanted to have a little bit more touch places um, throughout the process to kind of bring that timeline in. Yeah, that that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, we had another question come in. So how do you handle when, cha when management doesn't understand why it's important to go through the steps to prepare for the change? Um, this is a great question. So lack of strategic alignment, lack of um, leadership buy-in is definitely, we get a lot of questions about that. So the answer is, is that you need leadership buy-in. Um, and like, it's not a fun answer and it's something that people push back on a lot, but like the answer is you need leadership buy-in. Um, and so from a, driving change standpoint, it's trying to put it in terms that they understand their language and the benefits that they get from it. 
Um, and we like to think that we're all super altruistic and it's always about the good of many. That's not always the case. And again, I'm sorry, I'm like going to be brutally honest here, but we have to make sure that we understand people's goals as an organization, as their individual, as a team, as, and like even personal goals. And so if you don't have, if the leader is, is not bought in, um, your first point is really to, you know, try to access them as much as possible to understand like what drives them um, and be able to speak that change to them. Um, your other option is not ideal, but it's to go around them either to their leader um, and or to find another uh, champion potentially that can help you. But change really does need leadership buy-in. Um, to be successful uh, in almost all cases. Um, so it can, yeah. <laughs> Another champion potentially going over them, but like your best bet is to understand what drives them and try to connect it to that. Um, definitely majority can win out, but uh, it's not the most successful method or the path of least resistance. Other questions or input? I can't believe no one's disagreed with me yet, guys. All right, well, we have four minutes left, so I, I guess I'll wrap up. Thank you so much for attending today. If you guys are considering a large organizational change, Echo would love to help you. Feel free to reach out to us. Um, if you enjoy this webinar, you want to keep going, we have an introduction to project management um, webinar coming up. It's really great for non-project managers too. So if you have someone that maybe is a sponsor or an organizational manager, but isn't a project manager, but you want them to speak your language and understand what you're going through, this is a good recommendation for them. I'm really excited about a new webinar we're offering in January, perfect timing for self-care and wellness techniques to battle burnout. Kelly will be giving that one, and I think she'll be supported by Lisa on that one. We're going to be talking in February about PMO. We're doing a lot of project management office implementations right now for, I think we've got four different clients we're implementing project management offices for and optimizations, which is a lot of fun. And then in also in February, we're going to do a deeper dive into risk management, which topic after my own heart, risk management. So I hope you'll join us for some of our upcoming events. Please don't hesitate to reach out. If you do have any questions, I think Melissa will be reaching out with a copy of this recording as well as the slide deck. Um, and we hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us.